All right, so, so welcome uh, back um, to the second lecture. Um, I guess I should make an announcement about the schedule for the next uh, few weeks, which is a little bit different than usual. So usually it should be the case that Dustin lectures Wednesday at PHES and Fridays I lecture here. Uh, <clears throat> uh, but due to some traveling, uh, I will give the next few lectures uh, all at MPI, but note that there will be a gap of two lectures. So there are no lectures next Friday and the Wednesday after. So. <clears throat> All right. Um, that's it for the organization of it. And uh, uh, so the goal of today's lecture <coughs> is to say, some recall, but uh, some sense, but uh, so. To, Talk about the slide condensers, so light condensers. That's light condensers. In particular, like partly this will somehow be much of repetition of a very similar lecture I gave four years ago or so, or five years ago. Um, uh, but something I want to stress throughout is some why we switch to the light setting and which properties uh, you gain when you when you make this restriction. Um, but before the uh, uh, before I go there, let me make some kind of uh, uh, say just a few words, a few introductory words uh, from my perspective about what Dustin said uh, last time. <clears throat> so, uh, so what's our goal with all of this analytic geometry? So, I mean, for me personally, uh, um, one goal since uh, 10 years or so has always been to find, like there's all this fancy geometry that has been developed periodically, like the perfecto spaces and then there's, I don't know, prismatic cohomology and periodic stukas and the stimulatorization of local Langlands. This all works quite beautifully with the periodic numbers. <clears throat> uh, but it has to use some quite fancy periodic geometry, like these highly non Neusserian perfect vector spaces and so on. And <clears throat> I mean, I'm always hoping that similar ideas, techniques could also be applied, uh, well, not just some of our periodic local fields, but also the real local fields. And that's actually something that uh, I think really is possible now, but then also over the, the whole integers globally. Um, and so, so someone, in some sense, what I want is some kind of notion of like a global like this space or something like that. And <clears throat> I mean, this guy, this should definitely be some kind of analytic space. So I involve some kind of planar house or some non-trivial, I mean, some rip, modeled by some rings with a non-trivial topology. Um, well, it should definitely in include those Archimedean and non-Archimedean parts. Um, you know, hopefully kind of uniform language uh, to talk about these parts. And, uh, but it should, should also be uh, extremely non -assyrian. You can't hope for any of the usual finiteness properties that are often imposed when you do it. Um, so it's clear that you need some some new language to talk about these things. And so, uh, and so basically, the goal of this course is to develop a language in which it's at least conceivable that, that such objects exist. Um, and I mean, here's some kind of very vague idea uh, that's possibly completely misguided. Uh, 
<laughs> um, so when you when you do this perfectoid things and I don't know you have some kind of perfectoid field that you see here or something like this. <clears throat> But then when you have algebra over this, and you're always doing the same where you're drawing a variable, but with it all, with it also all its p power roots. Uh, so I mean, this is a prototypical example of a of a, uh, of a perfect algebra. Right? <laughs> and uh, well, if you think about how how you would do something similar, like not a, fi a fixed prime, but kind of globally. Well, then you say definitely want to get rid of the choice of the fixed prime here. So, okay, so maybe you have no idea what the base is, but at least you can try to understand what happens relatively. And then, relatively, I think you at least certainly want to somehow like join a variable with all of its rational powers, um, right? Because for each prime p, you're somehow kind of forced to maybe include those three rules. But then sometimes you're from taking care of the finite primes, and then you maybe wonder what could be the analog of this as infinite prime. And, I mean, somehow something that suggests itself, and again, maybe it's completely misguided, but something that you tend to wonder is whether you should try to form some ring where you're drawing all real power, powers of a variable T. But then you begin to wonder what kind of object does this should this even be? I mean, so you can definitely just treat the real numbers as a discrete thing, and then join T and all its real powers, and then this, this would be some kind of Banach algebra. But I mean, this feels somewhat artificial. That's the real number. I mean, and sometimes then the real numbers are just some uncountable dimensional two-vector space, and you don't feel like you've really made the situation any better. Um, so you, you definitely want to kind of keep track of the topology on the reals here. But then it's mixing the topology, like the periodic topology that you usually have a bond offering in a very strange way with the real topology you have on this. So. <laughs> so it's, it's definitely not a Banach algebra. And I mean, yeah. Quite unclear what it should be, somehow from a classical perspective. Uh, and even more unclear is like if this is the algebra, what should be the corresponding geometric object? Like I mean, geometry to any ring should correspond to a fine scheme. And similarly, this should be some other the algebra modeling for some local model space, as Dustin called it last time. But it's even more unclear what kind of geometry that should be. Um, so so maybe these are not at all the correct objects, but um, maybe we could at least, if these would turn out to be the correct object, we would want to have a language where we can talk about those. So, um, so some of such things will be allowed in our form movements. Um, okay, and so, uh, yeah, when Dustin came to, to Bonn in 2018, he somehow made the suggestion that one should really everywhere kind of replace topological space by condensed sets. So, since 2018, uh, we've been uh, pursuing this path of replacing topological spaces. Oops. Things and so on by uh, condensed things. Basis on this called condensed sets. Oops. Um, and something that I did, was definitely clear from the very start is that uh, this switch does resolve a lot of the foundational issues you usually have uh, when you work. Um, uh, with some analytic geometry. For example, it <clears throat> makes it possible to remove Mysterian hypotheses that are quite pervasive, for example, the theory of eddy spaces uh, or other theories. Um, and somehow talk about the being categories of like, complete modules and so on, and to derive categories of things. And so uh, it was clear that a lot could be gained by, by doing the switch. 
And simultaneously, something that I always like is that suddenly such a thing does make sense. And this is something I will in some form also discuss today. Uh, does make sense. Okay, maybe this is not really the correct thing to consider. Maybe it's some other thing, but I was quite happy that this kind of optic at least exists in this framework too. Um, and so our attitude then was that maybe we have really no idea what we're really looking for, but let's just uh, try to develop the foundations uh, of some kind of analytic geometry from the perspective that should start from like some kind of condensed strings. Um, and then try to build as natural as possible a framework uh, so as to at least accommodate all the known examples and possibly extend them quite a bit further, for example, allowing theory of project rear and chiefs. <coughs> uh, and then just see where you're led to. And then maybe at someday one can hope to uh, uh, understand how such more exotic examples might also sit in this formalism. So, so the attitude of Uh, well, uh, uh, or some kind of analytic geometry. And then strings with the basic uh, And try it out. Basically, non formalisms. Uh, and plus, I mean, also in the non formalism, there are sometimes some kind of things that are slightly beyond the traditional categories. For example, if you work over critic spaces, there are the usual things built on binary algebras. But on Grosser Kernel, for example, is a theory where you have some over convergent functions instead. And usually, this is yet another category. And so, you would also like to accommodate all these variants. And uh, <laughs> Peter, can you hear me? Yeah. Ah, yes. great. So there's a request to, to write a bit larger, if possible. Oh, we cannot. Yes. Increase. Okay. Uh, yeah. Maybe we can increase the image somehow. How? Yeah. No. The, I don't know. Is it possible to see only the like the blackboard that is writing on this? Yeah. Screen? There's no. You can't zoom. There's no one operating the camera in the lecture hall, is there's there? There's no one operating the camera. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it just records all the blackboards. Okay. Yeah, okay. Okay. Thank um, you. Okay, so the, <clears throat> okay, and so, so this course, it will not really touch on any, uh, anything fancy like that. It will just try to really um, <coughs> lay out what the formalism should be and how uh, it accommodates the kind of non formalism. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> All right, so let's start the course in earnest. Um start talking about life and that's that's <clears throat> and so the starting point uh, uh, for our whole series is kind of your profile and sets. And well, in the moment, we're restricted to these slide things, but first of all, I want to recall a big one. Uh, so let me recall the following uh, proposition. Oh, sorry, I'm not writing bigger, right? Okay, good. Um, this is something stolen always. 
<coughs> so the following categories are shown. Uh, so the first is uh, the pro category of finite sets. And sometimes this is a purely combinatorial kind of category um, where the objects are just certain diagrams of finite sets. So just formal inverse limits where the SI are just some finite sets. And I can be taken to be a, a full filter process of the order set. So recall that this means that I is not empty. And whenever you have uh, two elements in your process, you can find a one that is quickly uh, small. Oh, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a. <clears throat> and the morphisms okay, come from following this I. Um, then, well, this is an inverse limit, so you can pull that out first. Um, but then, uh, there are two traditions about writing limits and co-limits, either with an arrow and just a lin, or writing lim and colon, and then kind of combining the two for maximum clarity. Um, uh, <clears throat> I might at some point just write them and pull them, but for a moment, let me keep the direction of the errors. Um, but then, when you have a formal inverse limit, um, I think to just one TJ, uh, this should factor over one of the terms. So this should be. Um, so one can also think of this slightly more concretely, but now someone using in some sense this whole theory could be developed without ever mentioning topological spaces, but let's try to do so. Um, uh, it's also equivalent to totally disconnected compact optical spaces, um, where here you send. Uh, well, let me write the function in a second. Uh, and the third possibility is to take the category of Boolean algebras. The compact algebraic. <clears throat> so recall what a Boolean algebra is. It's a commutative ring. R such that all X and R uh, X squared is equal to X. So in particular, minus one squared is minus one, meaning that two is equal to zero. So these are all F2 algebras. <coughs> um, the, right. So let me write down some functions. Uh, so if you have uh, the formal inverse limit of finite sets as i, you can map this to S, which is the limit of these SIs, but with the inverse limit topology. And then <clears throat> this would map to the continuous functions on S with values in the finite field of the elements. Which then are also, if you compose the two things, just the cool limit of all i, 
functions from sets f i two. And one can also go back. Uh, if you have a Boolean algebra A, you can map this to the spec A, which is also, if you want, the maps from, so actually all points of spectrum are just a very good of two. So it's also just common from A to F2. Uh, and actually, we can also write this canonically as a co limit, uh, as a limit over all i, over from AI to F2. Where the AI has a finite uh, sub algorithm, which forms such a field uh, process. Um, right. Uh, let me let me not say anything about the proof. I mean, you can actually quite easily check that this function has inverse. Um, right. Um, so most often I will actually think in terms of this presentation. So whenever I have a profile set, I will usually just present it and. Uh, present in some way as a, as a such a limit of finite sets of I most often think about it. Um, <clears throat> uh, and now that I want to come to the slide things, I need to tell you two ways to measure uh, how big um, well, let's say S. When I write this, uh, I implicitly mean that the SIs are finite sets and the index category is co filtered or index. Um, and the size of S is, I mean, both cover, uh, is the cardinality of the underlying set. And then there is something that's traditionally called the weight. And maybe this has a different, let me just call it on the um, So this is the cardinality of the corresponding Boolean algebra. Okay, and, uh, let me already make this definition here. S is light if it has kind of the smallest possible weight. Except it could be finite. You definitely want to allow infinite things. Um, it's light if, if the weight is at most countable. I.e., S is accountable. Oh. Yeah, so this lambda is actually remark. If lambda is infinite, uh, then it's also equal to uh, <coughs> the smallest possible and now if I or smallest possible. I. In general, there are many ways to present the profile set. For example, a point you could present as an index 
a limit of an arbitrary large host set of just always a one element set, which is kind of wake here. Uh, so, but there's always like some minimal possible choice. Uh, and uh, if it's infinite, then this says it's so In other words, uh, profile set is light if and only if it's uh, countable. Right, so let me give some examples. Um, just a quick question. There's a question. Yeah. How does it compare to having uh, countably many uh, non-isomorphic tiny quotients? Countably many? Uh, Clopens? Uh, now, how does it compare to that uh, the likeness to Hess having finitely many uh, non isomorphic uh, continuous finite questions, if you take i to be maximum. Uh, non isomorphic. I mean, the, the finite questions are basically these as i's, right? Mm -hmm. How many of them? Uh, what do you mean isomorphic? Uh, yeah, I think that's also the same thing because any such finite quotient is given by count of, uh, by a finite collection of such. Open subsets, and I think it's still it's the same kind of <clears throat> uh, So let's uh, do some examples of profile, like, some examples of profile sets and uh, of of their size and weight. Um, okay, so finite sets. Uh, we can figure out what their size and weight is, um, and then maybe the first. Yeah. The smallest kind of infinite profile set is uh, the one point complexification of the integers. <clears throat> and one way to think about this is that it's the limit of all n of like counting up to n and then treating everything that comes after n as infinite. The transition maps are kind of always collapsing infinity to the previous. Um, so there, uh, this obviously has countably many elements, and also uh, <clears throat> it's a countable limit. Uh, then maybe the next very important example is S with a contour set. And one way to think of the contour set is just a two element set, zero, one. And in other words, it's a limit of all n of zero, one to the n, each of these is a finite set. Um, so this is still a countable limit, so it's still light. But obviously, it's much bigger than this one if you just think in terms of the number of points. So the, the number of points is two to the omega. <clears throat> so in general, these are really different. <laughs> um, uh, let me give one more example that uh, has some relevance in the theory, although it's so now excluded. So that one very important thing, like any, any like a locally complex space has two compactifications, the one-point compactification and the stone change compactification. But this one is small, this one is really huge. Um, so let me not, well, I just try to present this as a limit. Um, Well, let me, instead of presenting it as a limit, let me really say what, what are the continuous functions from S to F2? These are the continuous functions from the stone change compactification. But by the universal property of stone change compactification, this is really just a continuous map from the natural numbers to F2. But these are discrete. So this, this is really just a set of, uh, giving such a map to F2, you just have to specify a pre image of zero. 
And this is just any subset of the integer. So this is just this set of all subsets of the neutral uh, numbers. So we see that uh, this actually has weight two to the omega, and uh, it's not operatively clear, but you can show that it has size two to the two to the omega. It's pretty large. So in all those examples, it turns out that the, the well in the example that you gave the size I mean the infinite case the size is either equal to the weight or it is uh, bigger in some uh, so, uh, for some reason I hear, only hear you very softly over. Uh, okay. okay, so I just uh, there, there is something that I don't remember the answer uh, to. Do you hear me now? Yes, now I hear you better. Yeah. Okay, so the in the examples, the of course there are trivial estimates that uh, the size is at most uh, two to the weight, and right. the most two to the size, and so you can ask whether there is about the inequalities between them. So in the, in the case where you consider like like you have uh, uh, the like in the Cantor set and the stone check the 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 size is two to the weight. So the question is whether it can be the other way in the infinite case, that is that you have- uh, yeah, Actually, when I prepared the course, I wanted the same question that I uh, didn't. But I, see, I think I, I know an example, but anyway, it's a bit complicated. But yeah, so that's also what I suspected. So then let me tell you what, I, what is easy and uh, sufficient for us to know. Um, so what I did is I just took the proposition. Uh, so as, as Ofer mentioned, uh, you have trivial estimates and I will tell you why they are trivial. That lambda is at most two to the kappa, and kappa is at most two to the lambda. <coughs> and you see that uh, this one can be attained, and actually in quite large generality, you can make six samples where this becomes as large as this. Uh, but it's actually quite hard to give examples where lambda becomes bigger than kappa. And so uh, let me just note that in the case that's most relevant to us, um, if you have a, 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 a profile set that's countable, uh, then actually it's also uh, can be written as a countable limit of finite sets. So all the ones, yeah, these, these are all like, I mean, this wouldn't follow from this inequality, right? <coughs> um, Uh, so why are the things hold true? Um, so lambda I said was a finality of the continuous function from F to F2. This is certainly bounded by all the maps from S to F2. And this is obviously uh, two to the kappa. <coughs> and on the other hand, kappa is the homomorphisms from the Boolean algebra to F2. Right, because I said you can recover the profile set as a map from the green algebra to F2. Uh, and again, this is bounded by all the maps from A to F2. So, what's quite nice about this is that these estimates even hold true in the finite case. And the finite case, actually, this one comes in, comes in probably. Um, and uh, Let, let me do this one case where kappa is equal to omega. So then you can enumerate S, S, S. Um, you can enumerate the elements. <clears throat> and then for each n, I mean inductively, uh, choose the quotient, the finite quotient, S uh, to Fn. Then the compatible. Um, <clears throat> so that the first three elements are zero to Sn inject into Sn. <clears throat> oh, 
when you find such, you can always find such solution. Um, then you see that the map from S to the inverse limit of all the SNs, this is both injective because already for any two elements, you can distinguish them in any finite quotient. But also because it's a limit of surjective maps, it's also always surjective. Uh, so it's, it's actually a bijective map, but a bijective map of combat cluster space is an isomorphism. <clears throat> okay, so uh, so maybe this actually proves more. I did not realize it just a few seconds ago, but if you have an any infinite S, so because, because by set theory, we know that, that the cardinality square is the cardinality. You can look at all pairs of distinct elements. For each one, you choose a finite quotient which, which separates them. And then you say, well, the same proof that you ah, have the, the, right. then the same proof will show that in the infinite case, actually we, have, we can improve this bound. So the, the, the example that I thought of is something else. Okay, so here, here's a uh, remark of cover. <laughs> Uh, uh, that the same proof uh, shows that if, uh, if we're in the infinite situation, then lambda is a cross cover, right? Uh, you just uh, ensure that if any finite subset, it's a cardinality finite subset, the same as cardinality kappa, um, <clears throat> you build a finite quotient where these elements are distinguished and then take the whole. Uh, all right. Um, okay, so uh, because these light condensates will be uh, so important for us, let me just rephrase the first proposition for light condensates. So the following categories are equivalent. Um, so first is uh, and called pro n, so sequential so sequential pro category of finite sets. So the objects here are not some fancy uh, limit along some post set, but really just a limit along the integers of some finite set. And the morphisms are as before. Um, but someone not, I mean, you don't have to change the end. So that's an important thing. So the homes from. Limit of SM to limit M's. <clears throat> it's again, you can first pull out the limit, and then the other thing becomes a pull of it. Um, but let me actually uh, note that there is a different way to think about this. So basically, something you are always allowed to do in a pro object is to pass to any pro final subsequence. And then somehow after you did this, for someone to give a morphism from here to here, you should think that first you extract the subsequence of the ends, and then you really just give compatible maps. And so one way to express it is that it's really some co-limit over all possible strictly increasing functions. Uh, 
uh, of compatible maps, no compatible maps for all M uh, towards CM, but from the three scale version of the S. Um, you can also phrase this countability condition uh, in terms of these totally disconnected com compact cluster spaces, and it's precisely the condition that they are metrizable. And the last uh, one was uh, uh, Boolean algebras, and on Boolean algebras, we precisely made the condition. So there we made certain. Um, uh um so uh let me just note one very simple proposition uh that will be used throughout so if you were working profile sets and this has all limits but if you restrict to like profile sets and then well you still have all countable limits And sequential limits of subjection are subject. Uh, well, maybe I should say that subjective somehow just meant in terms of the underlines, like taking the actual limits. So, in other words, subjectivity on the point set of the compact process spaces. <clears throat> And I mean, something similar to, is true that any limits of surjections are surjective in all profile sets, but there it uses uh, some rather, I mean, the theorem of serum, some, uh, um, so some kind of uh, rather high powered compactness result. Where I see in the sequential case, it's, it's really kind of stupid. You just successfully lift. Okay, so <clears throat> the first interesting thing uh, I want to mention is that uh, the counter set actually plays a bit of a universal role within, within the light profile set in the following sense that uh, if you have any pro uh, light profile set. Then there exists a subjection uh, from under set to zero one to zero. Uh, 
And uh, I mean, the proof is a really simple uh, induction. It just writes this as a sequential limit, and then at each point, just pick a large enough finite quotient of this to accommodate everything you already have. Um, and there are two, uh, right, so now I want to come to two properties that like profile set set and that fail in general and that will play uh, a technical role in, in, uh, in what we're doing and are some of the key reasons that we make the switch. Now two properties uh, that are special to light. I mean, they may also work for some other profile sets, but <clears throat> that class would be hard to single out. Oh. Mean, there are other reasons for the light. Um, Uh, right, so the first one is going. The first is some of that open subsets of live profiles that can be too wild. Q and S. Open subset. <clears throat> then uh, U is actually a countable discharge union. And so, uh, so this is to be contrasted with the following. So in general, as an app, like, um, <clears throat> there exists a new open in a profile nice that are not uh, disjoint unions of profile sets. And one way which this could, for example, fail is if yet you could, for example, have higher chief cohomology. Uh, on these sides. So, I mean, but, I mean, just unions, they take, take commodity to products and on profile sets, these are somehow totally split. So you can so you disconnect it so you don't have non trivial recoverings and so the cohomology vanishes. But in general, the structure of these open subset of profile sets can be pretty wild. Um, uh, but here we have good control over them. <coughs> um, and why is that the case? So let's write S as an inverse limit of the SN. <coughs> and inside there, we have the closed C, which is S over U. And so this would be the inverse limit of some finite sets SN, uh, where the ZN are just, I mean, the image of. Uh, Z and SN, subset of the science set SN. <coughs> and then 
u is the union of all n of the uh, three images of Sn minus n. <clears throat> and so now you've at least written it as a uh, as a sequential union of open subsets. So maybe I should have said one way to think about open subsets uh, purely in this language of pro categories, pro finite sets, is to think about the closed things instead. So closed subsets, they should themselves be pro finite sets. And then the closed subsets are precisely the injective maps of pro finite sets. And so <clears throat> the closed complement should itself be a pro finite set and some on injective. And take the three image of this guy uh, the open open subset of S. And then if you want, you can write U as a union of all N. Now or the disjoint union of all N of this minus a two this one. These are all token subsets in S, in particular themselves like tokens. <coughs> okay, so that's one nice thing. And here's another one. Um, so here's a white token set. Then S is an injective object in the category of profinances. I will spell out what I mean by this. <clears throat> so this means that whenever you have an injection of profinance sets, And we have a map from C towards the light for finite set. And you can always find an extension to all of that. Excuse me. Yeah. Uh, I would assume that these don't characterize all injective objects, or are these exactly the injective objects? And also, they are more injective objects. So, for example, any like injective objects in general are closed undertaking products. And so, any product of light for finite sets would also be allowed. Okay. So, there are also some really bigger ones. Uh, but all the right ones, in particular, are like there uh, are. Uh, yeah. Uh, so let me uh, so actually the first thing one should uh, check is the case where s is just a show so, um, <clears throat> so in this case it means that this case means that uh, the continuous maps uh, from x to f2 Project onto the continuous map from Z to F2.
It turns out that <clears throat> under or equivalently any clopen subset of Z can be extended to a clopen subset of X. <laughs> Easy consequence of the totally dismissed. Okay. Don't know what it would be precise to do. Um, and <clears throat> okay, let's assume we know this case. Uh, then in general, we just try it. S is a limit of S n, so it's a finite. <clears throat> and then you want to, uh, and uh, this is not in general required to be the case, but I will assume that all the maps are subjected to the uh, You can always assume that. <clears throat> um, so in this case, you will argue by induction on n, right? If you want to extend the map to S, you need some extent compatibly to all the SNs. So induct on n. <clears throat> but if you've already extended the map to SN, then extending further to SN plus one, some of the whole situation decomposes into a disjoint union over all the fibers over SN. So, uh, So you can assume that as n is just a point, <clears throat> but then as n plus one is just some finite set. And well, I mean, the general finite set is very easy to reduce it to the two elements. So. Yeah, to extend the map, you just have to extend a bunch of global subsystems. <laughs> Okay. Um, uh, exercise, figure out why this argument doesn't apply to a general profile. So. <clears throat> and you might still think that in general you just similarly extend, right? As a, as a limit along surjective maps, you can always do that and then try to inductively lift. Excuse me. Like that. Uh, just a small remark. Yeah. Do you need? Non empty somewhere if Z and Z are both empty. What is unclear, sir? What maybe the if Z and S are both empty? Do you need some non empty? Uh, somewhere? Yes, okay. <laughs> uh, no, Z is empty and X is not empty. So what? Z. Right, let, me, let me assume that S is not empty, okay? It's saying if S is not empty, it's okay. Um, okay, uh, so I think that's it for my general preparations uh, about like, for finite sets. And so let's now finally uh, <clears throat> come to the definition of light for finite sets, uh, light condensed sets.
Das ist schon von der Kategorie. Und da ist von der Tipps. Uh, for the broken topology. Generated by the following colors. Uh, Finite discharge union is always allowed. Take the profile set and write as a finite discharge union uh, of other profile sets. Uh, this is the cover. <coughs> and uh, also objective maps. All right, so uh, let me okay, let's start the last time uh, spell out what this really means. Let's go on to give a counter. <clears throat> From light profile sets. Light profile sets. Uh, up. Towards set. Let me call these things X. So it takes any S. Uh, it's for conditions. Um, condition one is likely to forget. Uh, X of the empty set should be one point. <coughs> It's part of the finite distant unions, the empty distant unions, you know. Um, if you evaluate on a distant union or any finite distant union, but in particular the case of two old is a critical one by such, uh, then if you want to map a distant union of two like profile sets into X, you just need to map both of them individually. <coughs> Then there is this funny condition that comes from allowing all the subjective maps. Uh, this means that whenever you have any subjective map of uh, like profile sets, um, <coughs> then to give a map from S into X, uh, it's sufficient to give a map from T equal to X, or at least. Right? The first approximation you want that any map from S into X is determined by what it does on T. <coughs> But actually, you also want to characterize which maps from T to X actually come from S. And these should somehow be the, same, the ones that somehow agree on fibers of this map, so to speak. And the good way to say this is that the two ways you can make a map out of the fiber product by uh, uh, either first projecting to the first coordinate or the second coordinate. Uh, these should agree, and uh, this becomes this is what the sheaf condition for this uh, surjective map unravels.
And so before uh, explaining machinery, let me just tell you the key example uh, to have in mind. <laughs> let's say, uh, let's say A, I don't know why A, but some later, uh, be a topological space. <laughs> then we can define the life and then set. And underline. Um, and this is the thing that takes any S to the continuous maps from S, somehow considered as a complex Hausdorff space now, uh, into A. So here it's the stadium of select and then set precisely remembers how light profile sets map into, but continuously into your topological space. Uh, this plus all the functor reality. Right, so whenever you have a map between light profile and sets, it remembers how a continuous map from one uh, gives one to the other. And uh, turns out that this condition is always satisfied. Uh, there's actually not a complete tautology. So if you would omit continuity, then this would be clear, right? If you want to give a map from S into A, it's sufficient to give one from T into A, and then it's factors over S if and only if, like, the, like on the fibers. The map is constant, okay? which is kind of expressed by this. <clears throat> uh, but you're saying it's more than here because you ask that the continuous maps uh, have properties. In other words, if you have a, just any map from S into X and you know that after you restrict to T, it becomes continuous, then actually it was continuous to start with. Um, equivalently, this S is actually a quotient, has a quotient topology from T. And this is actually a general property for the surjective map of compact cost of space. Instead. They actually quotient maps, and this was useful. <clears throat> so in particular, uh, A of star, this is just A as a set. So in general, uh, uh, so, so somehow in general, this means that for any light profile set, a light condensed set. You think of X of star as the underlying set uh, um, and but you can also evaluate on some of our other favorite uh, like profile sets so and maybe the most important one is this one point simplification of the integers uh, so what does this unravel to here? So it's a continuous map from n union g infinity to a. So in other words, it's a sequence in by all the n in a together with a limit point. So in other words, it's some of the convergent sequences in a. And in general, I should say with a choice of limit point. Most often, there's at most one limit point, but in general, the block space there might be several, and uh, this includes Charles and them. And so, similarly, we think of X of any infinity as a sort of convergent sequence, where giving such a convergent sequence, we also have to give us a witness for what the limit is. <coughs> Um, okay, and then you can do more wild things. You can why use this as a cut as a counter set. And well, this is what it is, yeah. It's a continuous match from the counter set. Uh, one thing to note, however, is that it means it's just a set, and it's when it comes equipped with all the continuous and the of the counter set. Wild thing. Um,
Um, let me just uh, give one remark here and then forget about this forever. Um, uh, so if you have a light condenser, it's completely determined Presented uh, what I will describe as some pretty physical honker uh, by X of the counter set together with the actions of the endomorphism of the counter set. <laughs> Where this here is really just an abstract set. This guy here is just an abstract monomer. So you could think of a light condensed set purely theoretically as a set in a group with an action of a completely crazy monoid, but I think this is a strictly worse way to think about it. <laughs> Don't do that. Uh, but I mean, it makes the point that in some sense, such a light condensed set is a very algebraic kind of system. Um, so, so, but why, maybe I should at least say why this is the case. So this is precisely the case because um, you can, if you want to know what's value on any other S's, uh, you can cover it by a counter set and then and also the fiber product you can again cover by a counter set and then <clears throat> you can figure out what x of s has to be in terms of what the values on the counter set are and i mean these maps here they will be induced by some endomorphism of the counter set <clears throat> okay uh, um all right a much more important remark. I have a question about this stupid remark. Yeah. So, like, can we actually describe the whole category of like condensed sets as monoid actions on sets of this monoid, or given like some topology of this monoid? The whole one? No, I don't I think it's topology on this endomorphism. So okay. Like, you said it embeds into the category of action. Well, I, mean, I think just this fun to like condensed sets to, to no, sorry, this precise abstract monoid, right? To just yeah. consider sets equipped with an action of this monoid, this abstract monoid. I think this is a fully faithful concept. Right, right. So maybe you could put the topology on this monoid such that actually this is an equivalent. No, 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 because uh, you need to uh, ensure <clears throat> that this funny covering condition here. I mean that for any surjective endomorphism of the counter set, in particular, you need to ask the shift condition, and this unravels to some conditions that are impossible to understand. Uh, right. Uh, so this functor uh, that takes the topological space to like condensed set. Um, at least for today, I want to stress the light here because I'm also discussing the difference to the usual condensed set of it. Um, so this has a left joint. Uh, that takes any condensed set X and maps it to the underlying, what we want to think of the underlying set, and you can canonically equip this with a certain um, topology. Describe it.
X star. Oh, this the set X star. It's a quotient topology. On the following map, so you can, whenever you have anything that you want to think of as a continuous map from S to X, right? Um, in particular, you get a map from S or there so and just the underlying set of S. Um, uh, <clears throat> and the function reality, this gives us a map from S of star to X of star. Take this joint union here and endow all of these with a natural topology as a compact Kafka space, and this with a quotient topology. <clears throat> okay. Um, so the image actually lands in. Uh, this will always be like a mid risably compactly generated. <laughs> what is this? This is for fixed next sorry. Uh, this one union of all S and all. Or if you want, you could just take the country set because everything is subject from the country. Yeah, it's a country set. Like, I can actually write in this point. So this joint union over. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, like, the topological space is there's a notion of a compact generated topological space, which is one where you, when you want to test whether a map is continuous, it's enough to test it on complex spaces mapping to it. Um, <clears throat> and this is by definition the case for this X star, because if you want to test continuity from here to somewhere, by definition of the quotient topology, you only have to test it from here. So you only have to test continuity in these country sets. But these are actually metrizable, so it's actually in this sense metrizably compactly generated. I hope you can imagine what this should mean. And <clears throat> And conversely, uh, if you start with a metrizably compactly generated space, first treat it as a light condensed set and then go back, you're precisely recovering uh, the correct topological space. Because uh, basically, by like exactly this condition here, because the counter set subjects onto any metrizable compact topological space, um, uh, you recover this. So, uh, so if A is any A is any chargeable compacted generator, it would be A much isomorphically to A underline or oh. <coughs> So in other words, the kind of unit of the adjunction map in this case. So you have the, I mean, in general, any X will map to the sky, whereas unit of the adjunction. Um, uh, sorry. Um, for unit. Uh, um, and on these guys, it's an isomorphism. And so in particular, this means that these guys will fully trace me in that. Um, 
And uh, it's come on. This is a very weak condition to be in the of the composition. So, I mean, virtually all the topological spaces that ever arise in nature. I mean, all the, for example, I mean, we are mostly using these light condensed sets in our like function analysis, so to say, so in, for our topological modules. And <clears throat> any kind of banner spaces, first shape spaces, whatever, they, they all have this property. They all usually try the point. So uh, it's, it's not so bad. Um, I wanted to make a small remark here about the relation to uh, other similar topoi that have been considered in the literature. Um, <clears throat> the one is that it, something that I think was quite influential. There's a paper of Jonestone called on a topological topos, where he has a similar idea that because topological spaces are not such a very well behaved category, uh, you should rather try to uh, find the topos, and the topos are very well behaved, uh, which which is very close to topological spaces. So I mean, this is some of, something that's achieved by these light condensed sets. They form a topos, and one that is extremely closely related to topological spaces. Um, and so such things have been done before. One is some of the topological topos. Uh, so this is based on just the sequence space. <clears throat> so no larger cofinite sets appear, only the sequence space. And he uses a canonical topology. And so on any category, there's a so-called canonical topology, which is the finest one for which all the representable three sheets are sheets. In general, this is completely uncontrollable and more or less this is the case here. So this is not finitary. And what we only allow, if you cover, want to cover a light profile set by others, there must always be a finite subcover. Uh, but he allows covers of any infinity that are really just infinite covers. So it's an infinite collection of them that covers, but no finite subcollection will cover. <clears throat> but this actually leads to bad algebraic properties. <clears throat> you could also just use the planetary one and then get a version of a topos where I think most of what he does also works. Um, and then actually there's one that's extremely close to what we're doing. Uh, I think the paper by S. Cordo, if I remember right. Um, basically what they're doing is they take light from uh, profile sets. But only uh, finite disjoint units. So this is a finite topology, so that's nice. But they don't allow all subjective maps. Um, and uh, I'm not sure if I will come to it today, but it's really important for the good algebraic properties uh, for the function analysis that we want to do to allow all subjective maps here. And, I might just come to such a point today, or I might not. Let's see. <clears throat> um, and I think they make explicit what their stuff is in terms of uh, this picture. But I think when you only allow distant units, it's slightly better to make this explicit. Said that being contrizably compactly generated is a really weak property. Yeah. You can give some, some other things that imply being contrizably compactly generated. <clears throat> yeah. Well, every contrizable, for example, implies it. Uh, um, uh, and, or even weaker sequential implies it. So sequential somehow just means that uh, just this this uh, sequence space is enough to check continuity. 
And even that subcritical is basically always satisfied. Um, that's why, I mean, Johnson, I think, came up with the idea to just use this one because it's usually it's good enough to test for continuity and reason. Um, we actually toyed around with a version of use going even to smaller spaces like this, but in the end, it's actually quite important for us to keep the country set in because <clears throat> if you want, like the country set, it subjects onto any metrizable compact cluster space, for example, any like an enclosed manifold or something. You can always cover it by a country set. Um, and this is actually important for us that you can always find subjective map from like one light profile set onto the whole thing. Um, otherwise, we couldn't control the other thing at all. It would become too infinite. No, all all. Um, <clears throat> right. So I have here something about this, but let me not do this now. Um, <clears throat> This patient set. Um, right, so maybe this is all I want to say right now about uh, light and sets. And as I said, for us, our general the main importance is uh, as a home for doing homological algebra. So let's talk about light and density. Um, uh, so recall, like for schemes on any side, uh, sheets of the being groups um, <clears throat> always form in the being category. Um, actually, it wrote me to be. In particular, filter the column is like that. Where are successive properties? And so, you, in particular, you also have. I mean, all limits and columns exist. And uh, there's a column for example. <clears throat> and there's a set of generators. <clears throat> uh, in particular, this applies to, to light from them sets. And so, in particular, uh, it's definitely broken to be a case. And now something must have happened uh, that, like in topology, as we discussed in this custom Wednesday, like for topology of being groups, we run into this issue that they are not at all in the being category. But now we have in the being category, so let me briefly discuss uh, how that's possible. Um, so Dustin mentioned uh, dense inclusions uh, to be problematic. So for example, you might have the Q inside R uh, with this natural topology, or even more drastically, you could have R with a discrete topology inside R. Meaning with this natural topology. Uh, <clears throat> so these are maps of topological being group, perfectly nice ones. Uh, but where the co kernel is kind of problematic. <clears throat> um, so let me briefly just compute these co kernels in condensed being groups. All right, that's being group. Thank <laughs> you. 
what happens if you take R underlines, the corresponding condensed time, or Q underlines? Well, first of all, if you evaluate this as a point, you definitely just get R mod Q. Well, that's just the nice quotient. Um, but more interestingly, what happens? But to give a condensed maybe we also have to give it the values at any uh, any like uh, profile set S. And um, so, a priori, like <coughs> you have to be slightly careful when you take quotients, because now the sheaf condition actually comes becomes important. And like the naive answer you might guess is that this should be the continuous maps lesson to the reals. What do you do the continuous maps from S into Q? Where Q is the streets, so these are just locally constant. Um, and you can actually prove that you don't have to sheet find this case, and this is already a sheet, and this is a true answer. Okay, so this means that this quotient, it still kind of remembers something about how there was a topology on this guy, even if you can't really phrase it in terms of the topology itself in this guy. It still remembers that on this part, you should take all the continuous mass, but on this part, you should only allow the local constant. And so then, now let's uh, even do the more drastic thing where you modify all of uh, R, but as a discrete guy. Uh, well, then the underlying set is just zero, right? It's R mod R, it's zero. Uh, but it's not an isomorphism, there should be a co kernel. And well, to see what it is, we somehow have to evaluate. General S, uh, and we get some of the same answer. You get the continuous S from S to R module is locally constant. Uh, and now for a general profile set, for example, the counter set. The country set can be embedded into the real numbers in some standard way. It's a continuous map, but it's not locally constant. So this is very much non-zero. So there's someone controlling this funny thing by observing that it has non-trivial maps on general life. Yeah. So you take m just for the for the distinct here, then the continuous function, and then m maps to one over n. This is a map continuous map from this program set to the rational and not from the constant. So say that again. You take any infinity. And then m maps to one over n, and between two maps to zero, this is a continuous map from this program right. set to the rational and not from the constant. It's not. Sorry. That, uh, uh, I, I again meant to the discrete question. Yeah, so Q, I always think of the next question. Oh, these rational numbers are not at all embedded in the real numbers. Um, uh, okay, so let me just um, state the theorem and then maybe prove it next time. Uh, so part of this I already said, so condensed, light condensed in here. The growth can be in category. In particular, from the column that I expect. Uh, but uh, even greater, countable limits, I expect. Uh, countable products, I expect. <laughs> uh, and so the people that know this funny axiom, that's the so called 86 axiom in those of these paper, which is about some funny way that products can be filtered co limits. 
Uh, and this is satisfied for comfortable products. Um, this is worse than in all condenser beam groups where all products are exact. Uh, here it's just the countable ones, but I don't know. I mean, most of them are really only take countable limits, so it's not so bad. Um, but it's one reason that we were at first not a bit hesitant to make this switch. Um, uh, it's also now not anymore, doesn't have enough compact projective objects. But uh, one thing that's extremely nice. So there is a free guy. Maybe I should make three guys and then stop. Um, so you can take uh, <coughs> the the light profile set, the, the convergent sequence, and then you can always build the free condenser being group on there. <coughs> um, this turns out to be internally projective. Uh, Sorry. Uh, um, and this is really property that's extremely specific to the light setting. So, uh, in, within all condensed building groups, you have plenty of projective objects, but none of them are internally projective. Uh, except trivial cases like Z. Um, uh, but also all of them are really, really big. I mean, they all come from extremely disconnected sets. <clears throat> so they are kind of impractical. Um, this one, it wouldn't be projective in condensed being groups, but within light condensed being groups, it just so happens to be projective and even internally projective. And so this is the only setting uh, of any variant of condensed being groups where I'm aware of any non trivial object that's internally projective. And like the free guy on a, on a convergent sequence is actually kind of important as a very basic object in the series. So it's really nice that within this setting, it has its good categorical properties. And it's one of the main reasons we made the switch to the light setting. Um, uh, so the forgetful functor. Say what, what is the three guy? The forgetful functor from light condenser being groups to the underlying light condenser. Um, this has a left adjoint of three objects. Taking any light condenser sets with three of being group on that guy. I will discuss it more next time. But in particular, inside here, you have to light profile and sets while you're not embedding. And in particular, you can take on the light profile and set and you infinity to free condensed. Okay, so I will prove this and then discuss some other things. On one side. Other questions? Um, can I ask a question about that? So you said you stated two uh, two facts uh, about uh, uh, light case that are not true in the general case. And, uh -huh. uh, I this is a technical question to understand the the counterexample. So in fact, I found uh, so the the one can give counterexample using the interval from zero to the first uncountable ordinal, which is a for finite set. And so for the second statement, I I take this cross itself and then the closed subset, which is the first uncountable ordinal cross the set, union the set uh, cross the, this last element. And then the whole thing, the whole product, this is not the retract of the whole product. And for the yeah. first thing, I take the complement of the last element. And this is a big open, which is not a disjoint union of Clopen. This, this is not, not difficult to see on the other hand, you stated that there are cases where the shift cohomology is non-zero. So just for a general interest, I want to know if this is true in this case and what is the reference for this fact that the shift cohomology can be non-zero. Oh, uh, if you take the first uncountable ordinal, treat it as a profile set uh -huh. and remove the limit point. 
this is the case where it's, it's the open is not a distant union of cofinite sets. Does it have higher homology? I think it has. But you said that people know that sometimes it has non trivial Yeah, effects. I think there's there definitely good examples where there is common. Okay. You can also take the stone check complication of the integers and remove a point of the boundaries, and also it's a crazy thing. I mean, maybe it's slightly less computable in general. Uh, is it so true that like top is pointful if you take the whole category or stop this? Yeah, I mean, you know the underlying set, right? So that's not for face Okay. Uh, so no further questions and let's stop here and we resume on Wednesday.